Thank you. I did do it. I did some teaching. Oh yeah, I remember. Okay, we are in the book of John again. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Um, I know we got Teresa and Brock. Or the, do we know of any other sickness? Anybody leaving town this week for traveling mercy? We were, we were. My brother, my twin, got married yesterday, and we were supposed to go down there, but we couldn't because Teresa was sick. And yeah, uh, I'm leaving on Wednesday. Pardon? I'm leaving on Wednesday for Tennessee. You're leaving where? On Wednesday to Tennessee. To Perfect. Tennessee. You want to get higher? Yeah. <laughs> that. Are you are you are you visiting or going? Yeah, I'm going okay. to cheat. So. Do what? There's a lady with cheats is up there. Uh huh. So yeah, I'm going. Oh, uh, I'm not going to bring Brock with me. He's a man. Are you are you going <laughs> to the mountains or anything? Yeah, back that side. Okay, well you'll enjoy that. Oh yeah. You probably need a sweater. Yeah, I have one. Here. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, a lot of the some of the stuffs underground, like ruby balls and things like that. And it's the same all year round. It's like the caverns over in Mariana. You got to wear a sweater in there, whether it's summertime oh, yeah. or winter. I'm gonna bring a lot of sweaters. But um, you'll like that. It's, right it's really good. good. I I would like to go back up there again. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Abba Father, we thank you this morning. I'm sorry, this afternoon, that you have allowed us to gather together in the name of Christ. We thank you for the information that we've already received. We thank you for the fellowship and the singing. We ask now that you would open our minds and our hearts to the proclamation of your word as it is given in the book of John. We ask that you would uh, keep us safe. We thank you for uh, what you've done for Brock and Teresa as they mend that you would haste the mending process. We thank you that you're the healer and we don't depend on doctors, although they have seen doctors. We know that doctors are human like we are. But we know that you're the great healer and we know that whatever comes to pass is your will. And we're going to be seeing in a moment how it pleased you to save us. We ask that you would uh, continue to bless our ministry, that you would be preparing people as we go and we meet others, that we can minister to them in the name of Christ and proclaim His grace to them and bring them to Christ. We pray all these things in His name. Amen. Is it, is it dark in here? Darker than usual in here? Or it's all these things kind of dim in here. I know, but see these lights right here. There's a light right yeah, above you. Is that on? I don't know if that makes a difference. Or I can read this. Uh huh. Uh, it's just, I was just wondering if I was going blind or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when Brock and I go to the rescue mission. Um, for a while, there, some of the lights were off like this, and you could hardly read up there. I would move the pulpit just so I could preach. And, uh, and then uh, I got that little table light I, I had in here a couple of weeks ago. And I took it up there, and the next time I, when I got there, all the lights were on, so I don't know if they took a hint or it just worked out that way. All right, let's go to the third chapter of John. And um, we're, I'm going to try to finish this up this week. And um, next week, I want to. Do the woman at the well. Maybe, maybe all our women will be here and they can hear this. <laughs> okay, let's go to uh, verse 26, 326. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man 
can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, last week we saw where John anointed Jesus to be the Messiah. And uh, so here they are come and say, hey, this man that you anointed, everybody's going to live where he is. And they're all leaving you. And he said, I told you, I'm not the Messiah. Did you know, if you think about it, only Jesus can be the Messiah. Well, how can I say that? Well, first, he's the eternal one. Remember in Micah, where he prophesies Jesus' birthplace, Micah? Um, I wasn't going to read it, but y'all are all looking at me, so I'm going to read it. Chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one who will go forth for me to be the ruler of Israel, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So the Messiah is going to be the eternal one. God is going to be the Messiah. And we know that God is in three persons. And I don't know how they decided which one was going to come here. But remember, God is spirit. But one day, the second person became flesh. And he's the one that came as a Messiah. So the eternal one comes. Where? Bethlehem. Does anybody remember what the word Bethlehem means? Uh, means anytime you see Beth it means what? House. Okay? So Bethlehem is house of Jesus said I am the water of life the bread of life. So Bethlehem appropriately is the house of bread. Um when we were at Bethsaida, it was a house of fish. Okay. All right. Bethlehem, house of bread. And so, who? The eternal one. Where? Bethlehem. What? What did he do? He's saving us. I want you to turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We're not going to read it all. There's one day we will. Um, but I want to point out few things. Um, actually, you begin in chapter 52, Isaiah 52, and verse 13, and you go through the end, so that's a total of 15 verses, okay? Isaiah 53 has 12 verses. You read the last three. We're not going to read all that, okay? Um, but beginning with chapter 53, he says, Who believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. So here's God, the most beautiful creature, if he had wanted to be, came with no majesty about him. He grew up in a town called Nazareth. You remember the first chapter where Philip runs over to Nathaniel, knocks on the door and says, we found a Messiah. He's Jesus of Nazareth. And what did Nathaniel say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> because it was a town where the Roman soldiers went 
and had pleasure with the, the women there. And if they couldn't find any women, they got drunk. And so uh, here's Jesus, his parents, hiding there um, in this nondescript place, and they're raising a family, and the Messiah is growing up. And, uh, and so what, what were the Jews looking for? They were looking for the son of David, weren't they? Coming in a white charger on his suit of armor, his banners and flags and his armies, and we're going to overthrow the Romans. And instead you got this Jewish carpenter working there in this town called Nazareth that nobody ever wanted to live in. It's like um, when I was a teenager, my dad worked for the paper mill. And uh, he came one day and asked us, said he, was, he had a chance to get transferred to Millinocket, Maine. And he and I wanted to go, and the rest of us outvoted us, so we couldn't go. <laughs> um, and it was cold up there. But uh, anyway, um, so it was like if they had taken a boat from Jesus' family, they wouldn't want to go to Nashville. <laughs> but they went there, and he grew up, and it says, He was despised and forsaken of men. A man of sorrows. That's my favorite song. We need to get that one here. Man of sorrows, what a name. And like one from whom men hide their face. He was uh, type people when you walk down the street, you do like this. <laughs> so nobody could see who, see who it was. You didn't want to be hanging around him. He was despised. Why was he despised? Why, why, why did he come? Who did he come for? He came for us, right? And we despised him. And we did not esteem him. We didn't hold him as who he was. It's like if you were to walk into a bar, I'm, and you, you walk up to somebody there at the bar still, and you say, I mean, you say, do you know that I'm a son of God? He says, who wants to know? <laughs> we don't look like any different than anybody else, do we? And so Jesus, he looked just like an ordinary person. In fact, that's who he was. He had to depend on his parents, didn't he? He says, surely our grief he himself bore. Now, now we did not esteem him, but what, what is he doing? He's bearing our grief. Our sorrows he carried. You can go to Jesus with anything that you have. I don't care what it is. Um, I don't think anything's too little. We get. I think we get sometimes too picky about what we, we can go. Remember, God's everywhere. And even though Jesus became a human being, and in that sense he's not ubiquitous, in the other sense, in his spirit, he is ubiquitous. So we can pray to him anytime. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten, and afflicted. That's another thing we've got to get. And saying that. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He didn't die for his sins. You know, when he says we did not esteem him, you know, when they found him guilty, who did they think he was dying for? They thought he died for his sins, didn't they? You're a criminal. We have no king but Caesar. You're going to die. That, that was a pretense. Some of them really knew who he was. I think Caiaphas did. He said, it's better for one guy to die for the nation for us to lose our position. And about 40 years later, they all lost their position. Didn't they? <laughs> so he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon Him. All the things that should happen to us, He took for us. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. It gets, depending on how you want to look at it, it gets better. Listen to this. Um, going down 
to verse 10. And the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and will prolong his days. I don't get this. It pleased God to crush Jesus for my sins. I don't understand. I mean, I don't know what y'all think about me. I figure y'all don't... Yeah, since y'all don't know all about me, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but I don't know all about you either. <laughs> and, and like I say, most of what we struggle with is between here. It's not this. We can look really good to other people. But what runs through our minds and hearts is things that we don't want anybody body to know. I'm sure each one of us has something in their life that if somebody found out we'd head for the nearest bridge. And yet Jesus was perfect. He was the only one perfect. And, and his brothers and sisters didn't even believe in him. That, that was tragic. Remember when Paul is writing his letter to the 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter? He said, and after that, I saw James. That's when James believed him. And yet he had probably six or seven sibs, maybe more. He said there were four, they named four boys. He said sisters, all his sisters, so it's probably more than two. It took me three, four, whatever. And we don't even know if all of his brothers and sisters eventually believed on him. Although in the first chapter of Acts it said his family was there. Mother and, the, and, the, and his brethren were there. So at least they were there. So maybe he revealed himself to all of them. But can you imagine living in the same household of Jesus and he never did anything wrong? <laughs> and, and you always got caught? <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe you could maybe James could pass it off on Jude or Simon or Joseph. Uh, but anyway, he was perfect. The only one. So, okay, he's eternal. He was born in Bethlehem. He lived a perfect life for each and every one of his people. That's how I did. And then when they, he gave that for us for two reasons. One, as a sacrifice. Because the sacrifice had to be without blemish, right? When you brought your, in the Old Testament, when you brought your sacrifice to the priest, he didn't check you out to see if you were any good. He checked your substitute out. And if there was no blemish on that sacrifice, he would offer it for your sins. Because it had to be a perfect sacrifice. When Jesus was put on the cross, God didn't check us out. He checked Jesus out. And it pleased Him to crush Jesus for us. And I don't understand it. I mean, I know what I am. And he says, No one seeks God. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none good, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. All this is in the Old Testament. All those verses I just quoted you are in the Old Testament. They're quoted in Romans 3. But they're in Psalm 14. And it, I think it's 52. They, all, they almost read the same, but if you find one, you find another. If you got a chain reference on your Bible. While we were helpless, Christ died for ungodly ones. That's Romans 5, 6. So, Jesus has to be the Messiah because no sinner can be the Messiah. He has to be a perfect lamb of God. You see, they weren't looking for a lamb. They were looking for a David. Listen to this. 
if he would render himself as a guilt offering, okay, he will see his offspring. Who is his offspring? We are, right? We are. We're, we're spiritual offspring or spiritual seed. He will prolong his days. Now what does that mean? What happened when Jesus died three days later? He came back to life. He prolonged his days. That's us. He's, pro he's going to prolong our days too. Forever. Eternally. Everlasting. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand. So you keep holding on to His hand. I think, I don't know if you were here, but a few weeks ago I said, I don't stand here because I've always held on to God's hand. He's always holding on to mine. It's like your kid, you know, you're holding on to him. He's trying to get away. He's trying to get away. We cost too much for God to let us get away. That's why some people, um, they don't like the word once saved, always saved. But if you're really saved, you're always saved because it's not us. It's the sacrifice and the life of Christ that saves, not what we do. Listen to this. My servant will justify the many. What does justify mean? It means declare righteous. When you come to Christ, you are declared righteous. As righteous as Christ is. As He will bear our iniquities. Now how did He bear that? Was he, did He sin? Now, listen to this. Verse 12. He was numbered with the transgressors. That means he was counted as if he was guilty. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. Anyone who, all the ones that come, he bore their sin. And he interceded for the transgressors. Hebrews 7.25 says, We are saved to the uttermost because our high priest, Jesus, sits at the right hand of the Father and ever makes intercession for us. So he's interceding for the transgressors. That's us. He was numbered with them, but now he intercedes for us. He was numbered with us so that we could stand before the Father as if we were him. Well, I want you to think about something. In Romans well, I want to finish reading this and we'll go over to Romans 4. He whom God has sent speaks the word of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. Now see, we look at who, where, what, when. I think I said last week that the Hebrews could count up to 490 years. They knew it. That first century was time for Jesus to be there. And why? Because he was the only one. And he says the Father gives him the Spirit without measure. And then when he was raised from the dead, he, what did he tell the disciples? To wait in Jerusalem till they receive the Spirit, right? So he gives the, the Father gives the Son all things. And one of those things is a spirit without measure. And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You've seen these cartoons where somebody's walking around with a cloud over his head all the time? Well, those that are not in Christ are walking around with a different kind of cloud over their head. It's condemnation. And unless we go out and bring them in or somebody goes out and brings them in bring in in those sheaves you know they may die under that condemnation now do you ever get the idea that you're just not good enough maybe 
You know, I, I've had people and I say, what have you ever done to merit God's love in your life? Because I've, I've, I've never met anybody and I want to know whatever you're doing, I want to know what it is so I can merit some of that. <laughs> I never get an answer. You just hear the crickets chirping. But in the fourth chapter of Romans, verse 17, a father of many nations have I made you. He's talking about Abraham. So, when we look at the genealogy in Matthew and in Luke, that Messiah lineage goes to Abraham. We're told in the um, third chapter of Galatians that the promises were made to Abraham and his seed, not seeds as of a lot, but see as one, and that is Christ. So when Abraham made the covenant with God, it was made with Abraham and Christ. And all who are in Christ are part of that. So if you believe in Christ, you're part of the covenant. Christ has you covered. So look what he says. A father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. What he is, what God has done is look at you and say, I declare you righteous even though you're a sinner. Because I declared my son a sinner even though he was righteous. You see? We're made righteous the same way Christ was made a sinner. He never sinned, but He was declared a sinner. And God treated Him as a sinner. Now, we're not righteous, but when we come to Christ, God says we're righteous, and He treats us as righteous. That's the important thing. He treats us as righteous because He treated Jesus as if He was a sinner. Now, Listen to this. In hope against hope he believed so that he might become a father so that all your seed without becoming weak in faith he contemplate, contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and his wife was 90 years old and yet with respect to the promise of God he did not waver in unbelief. You remember the story of Abraham? He's talking about Abraham. What did Abraham do? God said, you're going to have a son. So what, what did Rebecca do? Not Rebecca, Sarah. She said, you know, I'm too old. So let's, you see this young woman, Hagar, will you have a baby with her? Is that trusting God? Did Abraham go ahead and do that? Yeah. Was that trusting God? Did he waver? Uh-huh. He wavered. <laughs> and yet, Paul said he never wavered. Listen to this. This is good. In hope against hope he believed so that he might become a father without becoming weak in faith and being fully assured that God had promised he was able to perform it. Did Abraham really believe that? In Remember when the, the three of them came under the oaks and uh, God in His pre-incarnate form, it was Jesus, told Sarah, 